hello everyone good morning good afternoon and good evening so nice to see many of you from different countries and different time zones before we start we would thank universe for giving us this great opportunity with gayatri mantra chanted by professor regina from brazil followed by dr swetha singh ka chief administrator would like to speak few words about our study group Om Bhuva Swaha Tat Savitur Varenyan Bargo Deva Syaji Mahi Jiyo Yona Prachodaya Many blessings to the universe. Back at you, Dr. Swita. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, everyone. I would like to take the privilege to brief you about Ka Homeopathy Study Group. Ka Homeopathy Study Group Pro Bono was organized and founded by homeopath and humanitarian Kavita Kukunur, president and CEO of Kavita Holistic Approach. This study group is intended to be an offering from Kavita to the homeopaths around the globe, sharing goodwill and solid clinical work within the classical model are foundational principles for the Ka. Ka mission and vision are very unique to inspire young homeopaths, mentor, provide excellency for educational purposes using holistic approaches via webinars, which are based on principles of classical homeopathy and provide professional continuing educational homeopathic credits for, for practitioners. We provide merit certificates for spreading the light of homeopathy around the globe. while celebrating stage 4 cancer survivors through our inspirational book talks dr kavita is a member of kevin friendly friendly foundation a non-profit organization that helps to serve poor people in greater needs in india i would like to take the privilege to say dr kavita kuknur was honored by national center for homeopathy at joint american homeopathy conference 2021 with prestigious north america homeopathic award martha olman community service award and honored as best entrepreneur award from dr n lingaraju principal of jsps homeopathic medical college hyderabad india at our ka annual celebration this webinar is moderated by ka family myself dr shweta singh chief administrator and professor regina renelli it is being recorded as we speak and we are live on facebook we will take questions at the end of webinar we will post jot form in zoom webinar chat at the end of the webinar please fill the form to receive certificate if you are watching live webinar email us at kastudygroup@gmail.com uh please uh, turn off your videos and mute yourself to avoid any inconvenience and i would request dr kavita kuknur to please introduce our speaker of the day thank you so much thank you so much dr swetha and thank you professor regina i want to thank ka homeopathy study group and thai team for the continuous support these webinars are for educational purposes only and see expert homeopath for treatment today june 6 2021 and our honorable speaker is dr subhash singh director of nih who speaks about clinical research on covid and insight on what is correct homeopathic prescription the webinar is planned for 1 hour and we have two topics to cover but if speaker wishes we can extend 20 to 30 minutes more in the past we have learned many new things on covid research and updates from dr raj manchenda dr jawhar shah kate birch kathy lemon and dr divya chabra and many more so today we are not going in depth but will cover at a higher level on clinical research on covid dr subha singh is an experienced and well known homeopathic doctor from calcutta india he is currently working as director in national institute of homeopathy he has an experience of over 22 years in nih since 1997 There is lot to say in few things here. He is the chief editor of National Homeopathy Record, a peer-reviewed homeopathy quarterly journal. Author, editor, translator, several books. 
published over 50 scientific presentations and research work, have presented more than 130 papers and delivered lectures in CMI, ROTP, seminars, conferences, symposiums, and workshops. Awarded the Order, order of Merit by University of Calcutta, has been a supervisor for more than 50 scholars of MD homeopathic degree course. And there's so much to say about Dr. Subhash. Let me say a few things about NIH. National Institute of Homeopathy was started in 1975 as an autonomous organization under the Ministry of Health and Planning and is considered as one of the top homeopathic institutes of India. For all the initiatives and progresses the institute is making, it is not only providing BHMS and MD homeopathy degree courses, but also doing clinical research activities and providing hospital services of inpatient and outpatient. Government of India, Ayush Ministry and NIH have done a lot of clinical research on COVID and we will see some of the research updates today. In this pandemic crisis, homeopathy helped tons of COVID clients. We welcome our honorable speaker, Dr. Subhar Singh to our webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Kavita. Just give me a moment to share the screen. Uh, I hope the screen is visible. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kavita, Dr. Shweta, and your whole team. That was a wonderful recitation of our sloka by Dr. Regina. Thank you very much. Uh, all thank the you. audience who are here, I see some of my friends, Dr. Praveen, some of my students. Dr. Rita, Dr. Sita, Julka, welcome you all. And uh, before I come to my topic on correct prescription, let me say a few words about National Institute of Homeopathy because I am very sure there are many uh, international audience here and who are not well aware about the various activities of NIH for them, for their benefit. Uh, this is what I have to say. Just a moment. Yeah. So, uh, National Institute of Homeopathy is a autonomous institute, and uh, it is practically the largest institute in the world, with an intake of about one hundred twenty-six students for undergraduate and every year and 45 postgraduate scholars we admit every year. Now these are the water bottles that you see. Can you imagine what this is all about? These are the water bottles who the patient have put here as a sort of cue because sometimes these patients come from different part of India and sometimes from neighboring countries also. And they have to stay there whole, uh, overnight. So in order not to stand themselves in the queue, they put these water bottles with the name and label so that you can understand that this is how the queue they maintain. They have found this innovative way. So this is just to show uh, how uh, numerous the patients are here. This is our Hanuman statue that we have at Hanuman, uh, at uh, NIH. This is where the whole story started, as Dr. Kavita said in 1975 on 10th of December. This was a hired premises in a place in Calcutta called Amma Street. And then we shifted at present to Salt Lake. And the foundation stone was laid down by the then health minister, Dr. Karan Singh, a very learned man. This uh, stone we still have in our new building. This is what you say. We have basically three campuses of NIH. This is the building and this is the gate that you are seeing. This is of the main campus. This main campus, which is in uh, Salt Lake, GE block. 
and it has one building for academy and for administration and another one for hospital. And then we have an additional campus for the residential campus, which is quite nearby about one kilometer from the main building, which have staff quarter, PG boys and girls hostel, international hostel, and a guest house. Then about 60 kilometers from the main campus, there's a place called Kalyani. And in Kalyani, in about 25 acres, we have a herb garden. This is the picture that you are looking at. This is the picture of Kalyani herb garden, where different medicinal herbs are grown. And they are used for manufacturing. And this is about 25 acre of the land. And there is a small OPD also running there uh, at Kalyani. There is another campus coming up of NIH in a place near to Delhi called Narela. And this is a, going to be a huge campus. As you can see the outline, this is still under construction. And we are expecting to have it finished by 2022. And uh, this is a uh, institute which will be a part of NIH Kolkata, where we are going only to have postgraduate studies, uh, MD as well as PhD. So this, the picture that you are looking at, the uppermost is the administrative block with auditorium, the middle one, eighth floor, that is the academic building, which have all the UG and PG academic building, and uh, one floor is only for library, and the lower picture that we are looking at is the hospital. I am coming to more details about hospital. So this is what we do at NIH. We have. Uh, it, it three, uh, uh, three aspects are there, education, patient care, research. And in education, we have UG and PG. In UG, we have BHMS, five and a half course, a uh, half year course, as everybody knows. And then PG or MD home is three, and, uh, three years course. And in patient care, we have OPD and 100 bedded IPD. And, in, uh, and there is uh, 10 peripheral OPDs in different parts of West Bengal. Earlier, there was one course of two years, Diploma in NIH, that ran for 12 years and then it was discontinued. So the 126 capacity of BHMS, where we get students from all over India, as well as 10 seats are reserved for Sri Lankan students and five seats are for Beamstake countries. And then we have students from all the places Russia, Japan, Malaysia, Czechoslovakia, Mauritius, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Afghanistan. These are the places from where at present we have students. And these are the division. We have postgraduate courses in homeopathic materia medica, organon of medicine or homeopathic philosophy, repertory, pediatrics, practice of medicine, and homeopathic pharmacy. And the total capacity is 45, out of which two seats are for foreign students. This is the library sir, uh, area. We, it's a huge library. One whole floor is about uh, 2,000 square meter with large collection of books and periodicals. And we have a, bank, a book bank facility. At present, earlier the whole, our institute started with affiliation to Calcutta University. And then now at present, we are affiliated to the University, uh, West Bengal University of Health Sciences. We have, this is of interest for everybody. Uh, we have two publications, which is published regularly from NIH. One is the Bulletin of National Institute of Homeopathy. And here it is published every three months and we publish various activities of NIH in this journal, in this bulletin. You can have an e-copy of this bulletin. If you send us your email, then we will regularly send you the e-copy of this bulletin. And there is a journal, the Journal of Homeopathy, which is published biannually, and which is a properly peer-reviewed scientific journal where articles are published not only from NIH, but from all over the world. Whoever are interested, they send it, and then we have it reviewed, and then we get it published. Uh, this also, there is a subscription fees if you require, if you need to have a hard copy of it. But if you want a, a soft copy, that can be sent free 
if you send me your email. Well, this is the hospital campus. We, it is NABH accredited hospital, 100 bedded hospital, going very soon to be 250 bedded. The outpatient department, where the patient number is about 2000 plus per day. This is the rush hour OPD registration. And the 100 bed hospital, a part of the hospital, you can see the nurses and the bed. We have 10 peripheral OPDs where NIH runs just OPD in different corners of West Bengal, in, especially in rural areas where doctors go, uh, go and they, from morning till afternoon, they uh, give service to the rural people throughout the day, six days a week. We have a very updated clinical laboratory with all the modern facilities there. Now, let me say a few words because now is the COVID time. So what NIS is doing during this COVID times? Uh, once the government of India notified, published an advisory that Arsenicum album 30C is a wonderful medicine as an immune booster and a prophylactic. After that, and I started to give it to various offices, government offices from where we, will, we were getting requests. So uh, police personnel, army people, or paramilitary forces, uh, various income tax courts and other groups. There we sent medicine with proper records and saw how they are responding to the medicine. Along with it, we organized around 25 camps for distribution of this medicine. And some of the research works that were done, I'm going to share with you. So here is one uh, uh, study that is going on, an evaluation on changes in clinical parameters of homeopathic intervention as an add-on therapy in management of COVID infection. This is an open level prospective single arm observational descriptive study. And the other one is a survey on the effectiveness of arsenica album 30C as a prophylactic medicine for COVID-19. And this was done, we know that the largest slum in Asia is situated in Dharavi in Mumbai. And this work was done on about 15,000 persons. The medicine was given and then their response was noted. And it is my pleasure to share with you that there was a 96% positive response. That people who took this medicine did not show any adverse sign and symptoms after consuming arsenic. And few who showed their severity was much less. And this is just one work that we have done. And then there is another one. A community-based cluster randomized open level control uh, field uh, trial to evaluate the effectiveness of homeopathic prophylaxis and standard prophylaxis against COVID in which we have about, as I said earlier, we have 10 peripheral OPDs. So 704 patients in each, of, not patients, the healthy persons in 704 in each of the center. So 704 into 10, out of which we have concluded eight peripheral OPDs. And the work is still going on. We could not complete the study. In the meantime, this lockdown and other assembly election, these things have started, but this is still undergoing. Then there is a ILI or incidence of influenza-like symptoms, where again, 30, arsenic 30C was given as an immune booster. And this was a retrospective cohort study. It, these all works are under the final stage. And very soon, we expect it to be published in a properly peer-reviewed journal to share what the outcome with the world. Along with, as I have said, we have given medicine to different 
police commissionerate to income tax, CRPF, forest people, Calcutta High Court, etc. Besides this, about 15 intramural research projects are going on funded by NIH. And NIH is also a center for PhD. All the postgraduate trainees are provided facility for their research work at NIH. Some of the facilities for the students, we have UG boys hostel, we have UG girls hostel, we have a separate hostel for interns, we have separate hostel for PG boys and PG girls, along with there is a separate hostel for international students. These are the newly uh, newly uh, finished, this is the football arena that you can see. And beside it, we have a basketball court and a volleyball, uh, volleyball court. Our strength is our patient, our student, and our faculty and staff. Our achievement from a single course curriculum of deep NIH to now, two undergraduate and postgraduate courses and five new courses are in the pipeline. We have also targeted to get ourselves as a deemed university. And our target is to be a global leader in homeopathic education and research. Well, for now, uh, this is all I wanted to say about NIH. Then let me come to my topic proper. Well, friends, this is always a question that what is the correct prescription in homeopathy? There are different explanations. Each have its his or her own explanation. And everybody considers that this is the correct prescription. What he is doing or she is doing is the correct prescription. Master Hanneman, in his various books, with, whether it is Organon or Metramedica Pura or his chronic disease or various small writings, he has left many things for ourselves to, uh, ourselves to perceive and conceive. He has given broader guidelines with this belief that we will be able to take down what is correct and adapt it to ourselves. One of the examples is that in case taking chapter, he has not given any performer. He has just given a broader guideline so that we can understand with, with this belief that we will be able to understand that in this case taking, we will take whatever is applicable for the particular patient who is in front of us. So maybe same was the thought when he was, he told us what is right, what is wrong. And with this belief that we will be able to know what is the correct prescription. To start with, my regards and respect to Master Henneman because of whom we all are here and because of whom the humanity, the suffering humanity got a new system of medicine, which may not be recognized in many of the countries, which may not be as popular as it is in India in many of the countries, but which is definitely beneficial. Time has proved it has survived in spite of opposition and it has proved that it is more beneficial than any other system of medicine. Prescription in general, and particularly in homeopathy, just a minute. particularly in homeopathy is an art and is different shades are nothing, but his philosophical evaluation as perceived by master and others. <clears throat> so what does the correct prescription mean?
there has been various attempts at defining correct prescription, but they all were each according to their own need. Basically, there are three types of perception for correct prescription. One is logical, and then there is the philosophical, and the third one is intuitive. Now, the third one intuitive, which many of the experienced physicians, they justify that with experience, intuition comes. Now, I will say this is the most dangerous of all. Because when you say that this prescription comes from intuition, then it is something which is beyond logic, beyond reasoning, and beyond anything which is guided, which Hanuman has given us in writing to be guided with whenever we prescribe a homeopathic prescription. So the most right one will be a logical prescription based on philosophy. That is aphorism 53. Master Kent say that the homeopathic principles when known are plain, simple, and easily comprehended. They are in the harmony with all things known to be true. Now, there are some frequently asked questions regarding correct prescription. What are those? Why? There are different remedies prescribed for the same case by different physicians. It is a very common saying that same patient, if it is shown to different physicians, then each physician will prescribe different medicine. That is a fact. But this can be stopped, and I have seen it personally many a times if you make it compulsory that just because you are making a prescription and i am very senior that does not make it right if i am answerable if i have to answer and justify my prescription that where i am guided how i am guided and what are the books on which i am making the prescription then you will see that there is not enough leeway to do whatever we want and we are then made make to do the things according to the proper guideline and then these four or five physicians you can do those of you who are seniors or are in, or from any college they can do this experiment anytime that you give patient same patient to different physician and give them a time and ask them the sir you can make a prescription but you have to explain and convince that this is the right prescription why you have prescribed this. You have to show the reference that from which book, which symptoms you have seen, you have taken. Then you will see that this varieties, the variants become much less. Which one of them will be correct and why? If homeopathy is believed to be a science, then the Are the correct one because our experience dr kent has very clearly said that experience is the slave principles are the ruler if we are supposed to be guided by the principle then it is a science but if we are supposed to be guided by the experience then each one of the physician will have different experience and then we will have our free will to prescribe according to our own experience which may be correct or which may not be correct so that will be a totally a wrong approach how important is disease diagnosis for making a correct prescription homeopathy nowhere says that pathology or disease diagnosis or practice of medicine are to be overlooked are not important they are very very important but you have to understand that the whole process of treatment is not limited only to the prescription. The treatment is a lengthy process, which has many parts. 
there is one medicinal and then there is non medicinal management for the non medicinal management part the pathology the diagnosis is very important but as far as the prescription is concerned the diagnosis is not so important except to know whether this is a disease is in such a stage that it is reversible or not reversible so that i can prescribe or not prescribe because it is to be accepted that those pathology which are not reversible in such cases homeopathy may not work guided by its principle is there a condition where the correct prescription may fail to produce a result if the correct prescription is made based on proper principles if the correct prescription is made following the guidelines given by master hanuman if the correct prescription is made keeping in mind the scope and limitation of homeopathy then it will have to produce result it has produced result for 200 years and in future also it is going to produce result what can be done to avoid such situation to know your books to do your basics don't think that homeopathy is a panacea for every type of disease it has its limitations of course it has its scope but one has to be aware of the limitations if a patient gets relieved after prescription can it be called correct no it cannot be called correct because basic aim of homeopathic prescription is not to give relief but it is to cure of course to start with relief will be the first thing that will happen to the patient but as we all know anybody who has studied homeopathic uh, book he knows that in certain situation there can be initial aggravation but that should not discourage us can we all have can we call a prescription correct only when we achieve a cure see homeopathy is the only system of medicine where a physician before prescription uh, prescribing he knows beforehand what is to be expected so before writing a prescription one must ask himself or herself what is my aim am i giving this medicine for cure or for temporary relief if you are giving a medicine for temporary relief because the cure may not be possible in that case so if it is relief you should be happy but if it is a case where the cure is to be expected and which may not be overnight because like disease do not occur overnight it is a lengthy phenomena similarly the cure is a phenomena it's a process so one prescription may not sometimes bring the desired result but we have to understand that if cure is the aim then that has to be achieved only and only by a correct prescription well prescription is the psychological umbilical cord which connects the physician and the patient that is the bonding the basis of the bonding this is not the right place neither it is come within the today's topic to discuss uh, doctor patient relationship but i'll just like to give a passing comment that one must understand the importance of doctor patient relationship especially a homeopathic physician should be aware of the importance of doctor patient relationship aphorism 26 we all know the therapeutic law of nature a weaker dynamic affection is per permanently extinguished in a living organism by a stronger one if the latter while differing in kind is very similar to the former in its manifestation if this is the law on which we are going to base our prescription and the whole homeopathic system is based on this then you have to understand the nuances of hanuman's right the finer points of hanuman's right you have to understand that he is not saying that it has to be same he is saying it has to be very similar which is a relative term because for every disease we may not get an ideally similar medicine but whatever is possible that has to be good and that will be the correct prescription in that case so a correct prescription has two aspects one the similarity 
let us not limit ourselves by thinking that only matching the symptoms of the disease with the symptom of medicine is the similimum. That will be only a partial similarity. Because there are three aspects that have to be kept in mind. The pace, the depth, and the nature. And here, the correct prescription, when we are talking of correct prescription, it has to be on similarity, which covers the evaluation of symptom and framing of totality of symptom. As well as the strength, <clears throat> the strength of the patient's disease has to be matched with the strength of the medicinal force. And that covers two aspects. One is dose of the medicine and second is repetition. That is why many a time it has been observed and I'm sure it may be experienced by many of you that you have selected a proper medicine, the best medicine, have done everything properly. But somehow it is not doing what it is supposed to do. In such cases, the reason lies that we need to check whether the proper dose was given, whether the proper repetition was done. So the beauty of homeopathy, a homeopathic physician, as I just said, knows how to approach and proceed to make the first prescription. And most importantly, further, he also knows what to expect after a first prescription. Because he knows that there will be aggravation. He knows that there will be not aggravation because he has seen the patient in every aspect. And if his knowledge of the disease is complete, then he can foresee what this medicine is going to do. That is why if we do read our old journals or hear the experience of the great physicians, that they were able to foretell that at this time you will have some aggravation. But don't be worried, after that you will be okay. So this is very important. So case taking, evaluation of the case, and framing of the totality. And then based on this, we make a prescription. And after that, when the patient comes second time, we reevaluate the case and decide the future plan of treatment. Now there are different ways in which the principle of homeopathy has been understood and interpreted. And in the various mode in which it has been applied, it is a big problem facing homeopathic system. Everybody has understood the homeopathic principle in its own way. They have applied it in its own way. Right or wrong, what you are supposed to decide. Some major prescription approaches. Acute prescription. Cases with sudden onset, progress and decline, recovery, immediate decision to be taken. Usually resolve in a very short time. And importance is to be given on striking observation or objective sign and symptom. Here, causation helps a lot. Then there is one angle is etiological prescription. Etiological prescription Etiology or causation is one of the key elements for a successful prescription. Causative factor should be mechanical, exciting, or maintaining, to be considered only if genuine and is of sufficient intensity, the causation. And then there is keynote prescription. Some great stalwarts have prescribed on this method. A few keynotes that represent the patient as a whole are considered, and similimum is chosen on those keynotes. There are many misconceptions. Sometimes in future, uh, if we can meet again, then I like to describe this whole method of keynote prescription for which Calcutta is very famous. We here uh, in Calcutta, we here uh, study Allen's keynote as the first book of Metamedica. And most of the prescriptions are made on this Allen's keynote. Then we have a constitutional prescription based on the physical and mental makeup along with morbid temperament. It is also called the classical prescription. People call it classical prescription. Holistic approach, although time consuming, but best way. Aimed at eventual cure of the patient, not just suppression or relief of the immediate symptom. Then there is intercurrent prescription. 
where intercurrent medicine is given while the treatment of chronic disease especially. Then we have miasmatic where the symptoms of miasms are given more importance. They are more relied upon. We have nosological prescription where the diagnosis is given more importance. Organopathic where the organ which has been affected or sphere of action, that is given importance. And medicine, we are matched with that sphere. For example, the commonest example is chelidonium for liver. Then pathological, based on the pathological changes, there are some examples we can see in BBCI. Totopathic, we all know that medicine which has caused, which has been given to the patient, those medicines, uh, medicines were made out of those allopathic medicines like penicillin, cortisone, and then they were used. Palliative prescription, where the aim is only to palliate. Now, these are the different methods, and I'm sure the list is not complete. There are so many other approaches. Then, what is the correct one? Each of the different approach that we have discussed, they have their some scope and limitations. The correct approach, my dear friend, will be one which will encompass everything, which will consider etiology where it is important, which will consider pathology where it is important, which will consider myosin, which will consider constitution. In other words, as Hanneman has said, that symptoms are the main guide. And everything is guided by symptoms, whether it is pathology or whether it is uh, etiology or nosology, all these are guided by symptoms. So one, the totality that we are supposed to form, that totality must represent the disease in its own extent. Not numerically, but qualitative. So the art of making this totality is going to decide whether the prescription that we are going to make is a correct one or not. So this totality of symptom is the main thing. And that has to be learned. That is what is taught. And that is what make one a successful physician. So after first prescription has been made, when the patient visits again, the physician is now faced with the dilemma, how to proceed further and what to do. Whether he should take the whole case again, or he should make the whole process very short. Question is piling up, what to know? To wait or not to wait? Wait till when? Up to what time should I wait? Because if we read uh, Kent's writing in second prescription, then he has said that waiting is very important at the same time. Where it is not necessary, if we wait there, then it will bring some undesirable result. So, up to how long, when, and when not. This has to be learned. This has what one has to study. Now, the biggest query, can a correct prescription be identified a priori? That means, can we know beforehand while making the prescription, while hand, before handing over my prescription to the patient, can I know that this is the right prescription or it has to be posteriori, that means, if the desired result is brought, then it is the right prescription. Now here you have to understand how homeopathic principle works. If we have to rely upon the result, then why do the, we have to learn so much of principles? So much of guidelines? Why we have to study organ and of medicine? Organ, homeopathy is a system where before giving the prescription, before making the prescription, if the physician goes through the guidelines, if the physician follows the Hanimanian guideline and organ of medicine properly, then before giving it to him, he can say that this is the right prescription. This is the correct prescription. You will have the desired result. As a proof, just see the journal of our masters. 
just see the case records of our master. Because when you are making a correct prescription, then you know beforehand what will be the outcome. Up to what extent there will be amelioration? What are the symptoms that are going to be ameliorated? What are the symptoms that are going to be aggravated? And what time there will be aggravation if the aggravation will be there? All these things can be foretold told by a physician. If he knows, it's basic property. In organ, we see that there are certain prerequisites for a physician mentioned. Now, for many of us, the organon seems to be a theoretical book. But I don't agree with it. Organon is a book which is very, very practical. It is a guideline which has to be followed in total. And it is probably the only book other than the religious books, which in spite of written 200 years ago, is to not have any place that is outdated. Any one point. There were many discussions, debates, hot discussions, fights, that organon should be rewritten. And whenever such questions are raised or such points are debated, I say a simple thing. Don't say because just it is written 200 years, that means it needs to be changed. Tell me the exact point where you need a change. The examples that is cited by Hanneman, are those not true? The disease, because the whole thing is based on nature. And nature remains the same. The law of gravitation still exists. A day, a night, and then again day. This is the cycle we live in. We still walk with our two legs. So that is why there is no scope of any change. Just because it is written some time back, that does not mean it has to be changed. If it, if it, it has to be changed, let us point out exactly where it needs to be changed. So these are some of the qualifications that is discussed in Oregon. Freedom from prejudice, sound senses, attention in observing, fidelity in tracing the picture. Now these are not words. These are the things one a physician has to develop in himself. He has learned how to be observant. What he has to observe. How to acquire this freedom from prejudice. Because these are the things that will make the physician so special, different from other system, and a person who can make a right prescription. Circumspection, tact, and knowledge of human nature, caution, patience, all these are the qualities of a physician that is very, very important. We can discuss each of this in details and why it is important, but I leave it to you, hoping that you understand that these are not simple words, but these are the aspects. If we do, do not have, we have to learn, we have to develop these qualities. So, Causation, we all know there are fundamental, exciting, and maintaining causation, and causation is a very important aspect which has to be considered. If not for prescription, there are many cases where the prescription may not be based on the causation, but the causation part has to be removed from the patient. Otherwise, that will act as a maintaining cause. A person who is having cough and he is smoking, or a person having indigestion and he's having rich food, junk food, that person will never get better unless that causation, the smoking or the rich food and uh, junk food is removed. That has to be understood. So similar, now it, I leave it to you to uh, answer this. Is it only a concept or its correct application can lead to cure? In aphorism 246, Master says, we must be guided as well by the nature of the different medicinal substance. Aphorism 3, knowledge of medicinal power, as also by the corporeal constitution of the patient. And 
magnitude of the disease. What is the magnitude? How, how, what is the depth? What is the pace of the disease? As well as the nature of the person. So as I was saying, that a similimum is not limited only to the medicinal symptom. Means matching the symptoms of the disease with symptoms of the medicine. But the final prescription, the correct prescription, must also take into consideration the different aspects like pace, the speed with which the symptoms have developed, the speed with which the symptoms have started being produced, whether in disease as well as in the medicine. Depth. What is the depth? Because if you remember our Metria Medica, then Belladonna also have tonsillitis. Calcarea carb also have tonsillitis. So it is the depth of the suffering, depth of the occurring symptom, the intensity of the symptoms with which it is produced and with which it is affecting the patient. That has to be taken into consideration. And most importantly, and most difficult, most difficult is the sequence in which the symptoms start to produce. Ideally, if there are five symptoms, then the sequence in which these symptoms have been produced should be matched with the sequence in which the symptoms have been produced with the medicine while drug group. I'm telling you, this is not an easy task to do. But who says homeopathy is easy? If we achieve, want to achieve something, then we have to master this. So five, four points has to be matched. The pace, the depth, the intensity, and the sequence of appearance of symptoms. Dr. Espide, a very renowned clinician of homeopathy, from Calcutta, he said, the more a homeopath acquires this skill of evaluation, the more he becomes successful in homeopathy. These are the aspects he has to be under, he must take into consideration. The generals, the mental, the sleep, the dream, general effect of weather, Influence of various position, thermal reaction, tendency of different particular parts of body, time modalities, craving, spatial senses. Generals are made of a series of particulars. For example, a patient having wear pain, it is associated with them. And created by blend of all the general and particulars into one homogeneous whole, that is the greatest of all the general. For example, leukophlegmatic constitution of calcarea, lean stooping ragged philosopher of sulfur. Particular symptoms we all know that those symptoms, it may be many cases seem to be composed of only particulars and have few or no generals of any importance, but they may become important if the particulars alternate with each other. Two particulars when associated, that means coryza, for example, coryza with polyuria, or common symptoms when it is associated with a particular modality. A special localization of common symptoms. Increase intensity of common symptoms. Common symptoms it may become something very special because of its increased intensity. And mental symptoms, there has been much said about mental symptoms. But what exactly is the value of mental symptoms? Hanuman has clearly said that they are to be considered like any other symptom. Of course, finer, where the question comes of finer differentiation, then if we are able to get the five various shades of mental symptoms, then that helps a lot. We shall therefore never be able to cure conformable to nature. If we do not, in every case of disease, even in such as are acute, observe along with the other symptoms 
those relating to changes in the state of mind and disposition. We must know, I'm sure we all are aware of it, that totality of symptom is not portrait of disease. Both are totally different. So in acute, we have to have an acute totality, which will be mainly based on location, sensation, modality, concomitant, and causation where it is available. And whereas there is a separate totality for chronic disease, which includes constitution, generalities, common, mental symptoms, and everything. This should not be mixed. As Robert says, in acute condition, chronic picture recedes. So no need to consider the chronic condition when you are prescribing for acute. If you are prescribing for acute and we are relying on the constitutional symptoms or symptoms which were there earlier, which are not part of the acute totality, it will be wrong and the desired result may not be there. So no need to consider the chronic constitution condition, which comes back at the end of the episode of acute disease. Chronic symptoms in acute disease, at times, some symptoms of the chronic disease may persist, may be active during acute cases. And if it persists during acute, with its boldness and strikingness, then they draw your attention, then they become important. Such symptoms are peculiar. Because many of the symptoms have disappeared and they have not disappeared. And they are often the guiding in the choice of remedy for acute disease. Past history. In chronic disease, the problem is more complicated for we have to take into account not only the present symptoms, which often show only a very partial picture of the disease. But we must also include many former symptoms that are not now active. That is why the disease has to be traced from its origin. Taking into consideration the past history and sometimes even the family history. And from many apparently diverse troubles, there always is a method and order running through all their illness if we can find the truth. Antitype, if we know our organism, then we know that in patient, we form the whole of the, we take the symptoms from three sources, the patient, the relative, attendant, and the physician's own observation. And what do we take? We take symptoms, we take accidents, and we take disease morbid phenomena. And together, they all, important as well as less important forms of portrait of it. And from this portrait, we take those symptoms which are the essence of the disease in its whole extent, that is the totality. And the same parallel is in the case of medicine is the antitype. So the, to match the totality of the symptoms of the patient with the antitype of the medicine is the art. The whole discussion is to match this. And this matching cannot be done by numerically matching. We all know that a case well taken is a case half cured mainly because of two reasons. First, it gives an opportunity to the patient to ventilate, to share, to feel that there is somebody who is listening to all my troubles, going into all the details. And second, because by case taking, the physician is able to get the whole picture of the patient suffering, starting from the origin to its present condition. If you have to be a good prescriber, your drug have got to be people for you. Dr. Tyler, who has written the drug picture, he says, because that is one of the study of uh, way to study metrometer. That again can be a topic of discussion someday. How to study metrometer. 
Drug picture style is one of the which has attracted people mostly because it is the most dramatic and easiest to understand. You can see a drug walking, you can see a drug uh, behaving in a particular way. May not be ideal, it may not be a classical method, but the most popular and comparatively easier method. So Tiger says your drug has ought to be a people for you with whims and fancies and terror, with tempers and idiosyncrasy and characteristics. You have got to see them talking about the world. Look for them everywhere and learn them and they will betray themselves at every turn and you will often save yourself hours of solid work by spotting them as they enter your consulting room. You can identify a calcarea captation when the patient enters your room. Or you can identify a sulfur. You can identify a lycopodium patient. You can smell a sorinum patient. This is one of the methods. However, there can be various approaches, but the correct, <clears throat> correct prescription must take into consideration all of these. And then only there can be one and only one correct prescription. Correct circumstance, general management, remedy, reputation, exact dose, exact selection of potency, and in exact timing of administration. So correct prescription is one which all the angles lead to, is one which all the symptoms lead to, and one which will cure the patient. So before I conclude, uh, once more, a very sincere thanks to Dr. Kavita for giving me this opportunity for sharing some information about the place where I work, NIH. And I take this opportunity to those who are listening from wherever they are. Please find time whenever you get an opportunity. Let this COVID situation be over. And if you are from outside of India or outside Bengal, whenever you come and visit Calcutta, make it a point to come to NIH once. You can give me a call whenever you are coming and I will make all the necessary arrangements. I want you to see NIH. I want you to see how we, uh, what we are doing and what is our process that gives rise to 2,000 to 2,500 patients per day. And how come we have 100 painted hospitals fully running only with pure homeopathic medicine, single medicine, no patent? I want to share with you. So please do come sometimes whenever you get an opportunity. And thank you, Dr. Kavita, once more. Thank you so much, Dr. Subhas, for sharing this great info about prestigious NIH and all the activities. Cannot wait to visit NIH and definitely I will do whenever I visit India next time. And also for the great presentation on the prescription, the correct way, and it is very refreshing. So many new things and tips we have learned. So Dr. Sweta, uh, would you like to take some questions, please? Sure, ma'am. There's only one question from Dr. Shishir. Uh, knowledge of disease helps in prescription or or it deviates the correct prescription? Your view, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to repeat it once more, please. Knowledge of disease helps in prescription or it deviates the correct prescription? No, it cannot deviate. It cannot deviate. Knowledge of disease is a very, very integral part of the physician's basic qualification that he should have, a homeopathic physician, in order to treat a patient, in order to make a right prescription. I'll repeat myself, I've said earlier, that pres treatment is not limited to making a prescription. There is a bigger part of non-medicinal management. So the management part, as well as knowing what is whether the disease is curable or not, and up to what extent it can be cured, what is the diagnosis, what is the prognosis, and how to treat or how to handle the case. 
all these things depends upon the diagnosis so diagnosis is not to be overlooked or not to be undermined they are very very important part of a physician's knowledge definitely sir uh, one more query is there from dr pavan those who are only working on mental rubric prescription is it right way for prescribing uh, i'll not criticize anybody i'll just say what is the right thing hanuman himself please read aphorism 210 to 230 hanuman himself has said that people had asked me to write about how to treat mental diseases and to them i have said that mental diseases are like any other diseases they are to be treated like any other disease mental symptoms have no special value they are like any other symptoms unless they become very important suppose you get a pain in abdomen and something very peculiar with the pain in abdomen so that becomes very important similarly if you get something in the mental sphere which is very important so that becomes a basis for your prescription but as a rule if we decide that in every case mental symptoms are the base, are something which is very peculiar so that will be totally wrong a man is made up of his mind and his body all our medicine have some mental symptoms as well as the physical symptoms so giving importance to only one aspect is like looking at one side of the coin only absolutely sir uh, we should work through the totality of the symptoms and exactly. thank you so much sir uh, very well explained and this is all about the questions over to you dr kavita so much dr sweta and um, we have professor regina um professor regina please okay go ahead thank you dr suba singh it was a, an amazing enlightening webinar thank you very much and my question is you, you said that it, there can be only one only one prescription according the circumstances so we base on masters organon masters materia medica kent herring bonny house uh, are there any space for intuition based on these books do you agree or you just say we better not take the courage of faith Rajina, you have to make a question a little bit easier. Okay, I'm Sami. We have Organo Materia Medica. We have Kant's Herring, other theoretical masters. But you said um, my question is: Is there space for intuition based on these books? that we study can we base that on the courage of our faith on the books we study and the intuition of the circumstance of the client in our office uh rezina first of all i like to uh, uh, object most humbly that these books are not theoretical books whether we are talking of organ on or we are talking of any of hanuman's book please do not uh, talk of them as if they are theoretical books they are very very practical books on which a system of medicine was based and which has lasted its test of time for 200 years number 1 i have objected to intuition because intuition comes from repeated experience so when you have repeated experience and then become your your way of thinking becomes intuitive then you are biased then you are having your thoughts beforehand you are having prejudice suppose i in this season suppose i am in calcutta and there uh, covid is raging all over and there is after covid post covid complication people are having dry cough so suppose for i treat bryonia alba i use bryonia alba with and give 40 patient and worked wonderfully 
So the 41st patient which came to me and with the post-COVID dry cough, I do not take the whole case and think that because of this, this is my experience says that Brainia will work. That is wrong. That is being prejudiced. That is what Hanneman has said not to be done. And then the third part of the question was the patient's circumstance in which the patient has lived, the, which the patient's symptoms has developed. They are very, very important in order to understand how the symptoms has developed. For example, if you are from Brazil, you have a symptom, I'm giving you an example, don't take it otherwise. Suppose you have burping, and I am in Calcutta, I am having burping. So your burping, when I consider your burping, I must take into consideration what is the food that you eat there, how you live there, what you uh, exercise is there, what are your lifestyles, and similarly, when you are taking my burping into taking into consideration, then you have to understand my food habits, my lifestyle, and everything. So the circumstance cannot be overlooked. They are very, very important part because they tell you a lot whether this symptom is important or not. Thank you. Back at you, Dr. Kavita. Thank you so much, Professor Regina. And um, I have my professor, Dr. Praveen Kumar sir also in today's webinar. Thank you so much, sir. And- uh, It's lovely. Dr. Thank Dr. you. Thank you, Kavita. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Subhash. It was wonderful. Hello. It's, it is really a very educative, informative, because usually argonon is neglected, even in the colleges, by the practitioners. Many people would say that. But he has given, in such a lucid way, very, very informa informative lecture. I really appreciate him. Thanks a lot for arranging this lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, sir, um, would you like to take one more question, Dr. Subhas, if you yeah, have sure. time? Sure. Anything? I... So, Dr. Sveta, there was someone, um, yes, any questions in the chat, please? There's one question from Dr. Mossam. Uh, susceptibility in similar symptoms in case of twins, how to differentiate on that cases? It is only in the movies that the uh, twins have all things similar. In <laughs> reality, as far as I have seen the twins, the symptoms are totally different. They have totally different personality. And the susceptibility or assessment of the susceptibility depends upon the symptoms, the intensity of the symptoms, and how far the weather or the external circumstance is affecting the patient. So when we are talking of such susceptibility, whether they are twins or not, we have to take into consideration these aspects and by these only we can understand what is the susceptibility of the patient and assess the susceptibility of the patient. One more question is there from Dr. Pawan. Is there intercurrent remedies for COVID-19? There is. There is. And intercurrent means depending upon the first prescription. It comes between the after the first. So it all depends upon what was your first prescription. How can there be a general guideline that this will be an intercurrent for every case of COVID-19? There cannot be. At least that cannot be homeopathy. That's all about the queries. Uh, over to you, Dr. Kavita. Thank you, sir, for uh, answering and listening to the all the questions so patiently. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sveta. And um, we would like to take privilege to honor your precious time, Dr. Subhas, in sharing your knowledge and wisdom at our cast study group today with uh, our certificate um, kindly accepted from our team, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, with your permission, sir, we will bring back again Dr. Shivas on our webinars, definitely, because it's very uh, enlightening and uh, very informative and great presentation. So um, we will definitely bring back again. 
and uh, Dr. Shubhas, with your permission, can I announce the upcoming events, please? Please, and please permit me because it is 10.30 here. <laughs> please, exactly. Uh, because... <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shubhas. We'll see you again. And on June 20th, we have Dr. Sachindra Joshi and Dr. Bhavishya Joshi on how to prescribe birds using MAP. And do not miss to register to Mission 5000 webinar series conducted by Dr. Jawhar Sham, Enlightenment Education. Um, so to register, visit www.onlinehomeopathycourse.com. They have over 90 speakers and amazing webinars. And we have many more renowned homeopaths lined up for our CARB webinars. So I thank first our homeopathy study group and their team for the continuous support. And today we have several uh, team members, volunteers, to name few, Dr. Yashika, Dr. Bhavana, Dr. Srija, Dr. Nupursha, Dr. Mamata, Dr. Lakshita, Dr. Hira Lal Agarwal, Dr. Sweta Varma, Dr. Deepa, and many more. We have many people who have joined from different parts of the world, and we always thank all the participants for their presence and undivided attention. If you haven't filled the JOT form, um, that is, it is posted in the Zoom. Please uh, get the link to get the uh, certificate. And if you are on the Facebook, do email us, castedigroup at gmail.com. And we always honor the past, <coughs> accept the current pandemic crisis, and thank you, universe, and all the dignitaries of car speakers of our webinars. So we are going to wrap, and Dr. Sweta will end the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Kavita, and thank you, uh, all the viewers, for joining us. And... Uh, for future webinars, you can uh, subscribe our, uh, uh, for the future webinars, you can uh, follow our uh, social media platforms at Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter with the name Ka Homeopathy Study Group. And you can follow our uh, YouTube channel with the name Kavita Kukunur uh, for the uh, previous uh, webinar recordings. So thank you all of you. And if you have any query, you can reach us at uh, studygroup at gmail.com. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you once again, Professor Regina and Dr. Sweta for moderating the webinar. Thank you all. See you all again next day. Thank you so much, ma'am. Good night, everyone. Good night. Goodbye all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.